Welcome to the 130th Zoom presentation ahead, of the Canadian Association of the Club of Rome. I'll read. We in Ottawa wish to acknowledge that we are located in the unceded territory of the Anishabi Algonquin people. KCOR is a non governmental organization dedicated to intelligent debate and action on global issues. These presentations and the website are a vital contribution to dealing with the wealth of misinformation about climate change. Today, it's my great privilege to introduce Dave Doherty, who will share with us the wisdom of his latest book, Do It Yourself a Favor, Live Lightly, Live Better, which contains some 200 ways each of us can help to reduce the threat of climate change. David is an ecologist and environmental scientist and an author. He has worked as a private consultant and for the federal government on environmental policy. He joined KCOR in 2012 and has made an enormous contribution, sharing important information and fact-checking to combat misinformation. After a 50 minute talk, there will be another approximately 40 minutes of questions and discussion. Please use the chat function to submit your question or comment. Please be brief, others are waiting. David, you're on. Thank you very much, Peter. And welcome to everybody who's attending our presentation today. I'd like to tell you about my latest book. This one is a nonfiction book. The inception of the idea was because a young man that I know asked me a bunch of questions. I'm not going to go through in great detail some of the stuff that's on these slides because I'm afraid I'm suffering a bit of laryngitis. So I'd like you to read these. The essence of it is, um, why should we act? Other people are doing things that don't go along with trying to reduce emissions. I'm tired of feeling badly about the way I'm being told to run my life. Um, the system around me is what is encouraging me to have emissions. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to be telling me to reduce my emissions. He also made some insightful comments. We're being told how to function in this system. We know what's needed. You guys have been educating us for 40 years or so on how to do recycling, how to behave responsibly, but it's not happening. We know there are big changes that are needed, but we're trapped in the system as little individual cogs. In responding to those and a few other questions, it occurred to me that perhaps it would be wise to write a book about this. Among other things in our discussions, he said, some of this is gonna cost me money. And it occurred to me, well, that's true, but some of it's gonna save you money. It may even increase your income. We do have at least one member of KCOR who's got a solar array and he sells his power to the grid. It may mean some, some work or some sacrifice on my part. Well, you can look at it differently. You may be able to enjoy finding new ways to conduct your personal affairs. Other people are going ahead at my expense. They're even probably going to raise their emissions. The more money they get, the more jets they get, the more times they go to the Côte d'Azur or wherever it is that pleases them. And that's an, an unfortunate um, thing for me to observe when I'm working to try to keep my kids in clothes and going to school very difficult for me to observe them. Well, yes, that's true, but we can only control what we can control. 
And we can't really worry about what's going on over in somebody else's backyard. He told me, I'm constantly being told to buy more stuff. If I'm not buying more stuff, how are we going to have economic growth? And my response is basically, look, we all now know that things have changed. And buying more stuff is no longer appropriate. And the bad behavior of other people doesn't mean that you should follow in their footsteps. There are other ways to live in life. We have another member of KCOR whose uh, favorite saying is more fun, less stuff. And I think that that's the appropriate approach. He said to me, big organizations are just going to go on and they're even going to benefit from my sacrifices. My response, mentally, not that I said this to him at the time, was, well, I think each of us needs to go on his own path. We can choose other ways to do things. We can invest in firms that are actually leading towards sustainability. We don't have to follow other people's footsteps. And if other people choose to follow our footsteps, then everybody wins. He also said to me, we're struggling to keep a roof over our heads. It's actually, for many of us who are comfortably upper middle class or middle class, hard to understand. Uh, but especially young adults today are struggling to keep up. They're not getting the kinds of wage increases that have been so common in the past and that executives and um, other highly paid people are seeing. He also said, look, climate change is not hurting my family. And I thought about that for a while and decided, you know, 20 years ago, that might have been the case, but it isn't true anymore. Everybody is experiencing these higher temperatures, heat waves, fires, floods, droughts, storms, rising sea levels, you name it, all kinds of things. We're all also getting indirect effects, like more expensive food or less food available. It's now personal. Since it's become personal, we really need to do something. He said, you know, that Many of my friends and I, we have more important concerns like which bar is it on which we're going to descend on Friday night? <laughs> you know, there are other ways of there are other ways of conducting your life. And if you've been following what's happening in the news these days about the uh, carcinogenicity of alcohol, you might actually want to rethink going to the bar on Friday night. Uh, I myself am drinking less alcohol, I'm staying closer to home, and I think that I and my family are healthier and happier as a result. He told me, and it was an interesting word for him to use, it isn't even in my lexicon, we don't have time for this malarkey. And he did acknowledge that that's a, a word from previous generations. And I said, you know, this can be far from boring or waste of time or unpleasant. It, it can be absolutely fascinating to dig into things that you can do differently in your life. He finally said, and this is what really sparked me to write the book, I don't know where to start. It's interesting because he actually has already started. He just doesn't know it. Anyway, that's why I put together this book. And I went on the internet and did some research and was really not impressed by what I found. I didn't see any other guidebook that I thought was suited to the developed world in light of what's available in 2022. And now 2023, the book was published in 2022 in December. And I thought, you know, we really do need to throw something together. So I put out an invitation to KCOR members in the fall of 2022. Uh, it was a three-part plan. One was to send a letter to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, and that did get sent. Another was to revise KCOR's plan to survive document, and that's under discussion by 
a small working group. I guess there are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of a dozen people who've been working on that. I invited people to work together with me on this book. I to be more interested in doing the plan to survive. And I realized to get this compendium out in the time frame that was appropriate to get somebody like this friend of mine started, I needed to do it quickly. So I sent out an inf invitation to family members, the boss who's present, <clears throat> excuse me, present on the call today, my wife, Jean, um, the aides, which were my two daughters, and the artist, and he is my son-in-law. He's the, the guy who did the uh, cover artwork. And uh, he read at least portions of the book and then said to me, it gives me the impression that the world is dying at our hands, which is why he thought um, to draw the picture, which will be behind my head and when we take questions later and which was uh, present on the first slide, uh, the world going through time through a, um, an hourglass and coming out dead. The first thing I did is I recorded a personal compendium. I was able to add to that a few ideas I got from other people in KCOR. And I definitely used Google, a few other search engines. I found that there are lots of ENGOs, environmental non-governmental organizations that have been prolific on this. I did some searching of the background for what exactly is climate change, why is it happening and so on, which I'm gonna uh, explain in a moment. And then I found, I don't know, dozens of possible sources. And the major ones that I used to sort of affirm that many of the things that I was doing uh, are things that other people are doing as well, and to evaluate each of one of them in ways that I'm gonna explain in a second. And the major ones are on the right of the slide here. So the book is divided into 11 chapters. The introduction, as I mentioned, is an explanation brief of climate change. Then there are my ratings and my sources, and then how you can contribute in each of a number of different settings. So your home, um, close to your home, around your community, at work, at play, on vacation, while you're shopping, while you're in social settings, and how you can support your community and then uh, trying to bring it all together. So as part of the background information, I thought it was important to review the fact that we've known snippets about this since the early 1800s. Uh, a lot of prominent people have been involved in trying to discern what's happening in our atmosphere and in our oceans. Uh, there's even been a very prominent Canadian working on it. I went looking for carbon footprint calculators, and I found a lot of them on the internet. One of the things that confused me when I examined each was I go through their sets of questions and come out with a result at the end, and one calculator would tell me my impact, my, my emissions were four tons per year, and another would tell me they're 40 tons per year. And frankly, uh, an order of magnitude difference in what my emissions are makes a huge difference. And it, it leaves me thinking, well, what really are my emissions? With, with no good way of determining what they are or what I might do about them. I also looked at life cycle analysis. One of the things that I found there was, this is exceedingly complex and way beyond the ability of many people that I would like to have read this book uh, would have to understand. So what I decided in the end was that I would break down each of the proposed activities or actions uh, that I wanted to put in the book according to difficulty and their potential to reduce emissions. Each of those uh, difficulty as far as, well, it is, is it easy, hard, really hard, or really hard? And if anybody has been climbing mountains, you'll know what I mean about really hard. 
um, as far as the potential to reduce emissions. Some of them, well, they're okay. Some of them are very good. And some of them are just, wow, that's what we really need to do. As I was working on that scheme, I realized there are also some things that are really bad. And I ought to point out a few of those as I go. So here are some examples of, a, uh, Peter mentioned 200, it's actually uh, about 300 uh, items that are in the book, especially when you consider all of the things that are just not things that we ought to be undertaking, which I'll show one example uh, in a slide or two. Um, so if it's got a check mark, I do this or have done it in the past. If it's got a walker, it's pretty easy to do, or it doesn't cost you very much money or both. Might even make you money. Sometimes it really doesn't have a huge change, but it contributes. Sometimes it's really good. Like always making sure that you're washing a full load of clothes. Um, I know people who've got you know, half a load, but they do one load every, every day, which is just waste. And then there are some things that are really the best kinds of things that, that you can do. So stay close to home. You don't need to travel very far for entertainment. You may even be able to sit in your living room. Use as little fuel as you can, ride your bike. We have a family member who rides his bike thousands of kilometers every year. He's been on trips across the country. He's been on trips all around BC. He's been across the prairies. This is his way of having fun. Here are some examples of things that are a little bit more difficult. You can move closer to work. That's really very good. You can put awnings on the outside of your house to prevent heat gain in the summer. That's a little bit more expensive and you have to manage those awnings. Um, and if you really wanna go whole hog, I haven't done this yet, um, but it has been done at least in Ontario and it's been done in quite a, quite a few countries around the world now, the most successful being in Netherlands, sue the government. And then there are some things where I just, I think we need to stop doing this. There are still people who claim climate change is not happening. And if it is happening, it's not our fault. And if it is our fault, there's nothing we can do about it. It's kind of a standard legal defense. Well, frankly, it is time each of us did something about it. And I, and I also decided maybe there are some things that really decide, did, sorry, that really deserve two bad faces. So you want to drive a monster truck or rolling coal? I think you need to rethink that. I had a rolling coal uh, pickup truck that was parked down the street about a year and a half ago where I'm currently living. Illegal, by the way. I decided I wanted to make the book a little bit pretty. So I went through my collection of old photographs and it brought back great memories, but it was also a reminder of my personal participation in the consumer economy. And uh, I am in the process of changing that. I think I might have skipped a slide somehow, or maybe it got taken out. Anyway, there was a slide with uh, limericks because I have introduced each uh, chapter with a limerick for a little bit of fun. More fun, less stuff. In the end, I put this up on Amazon's Kindle Direct Publishing. So it's a self-published book and it's available around the world. Since I completed it in December, I have been circulating it. I've used the KCOR website, the KCOR Twitter account, which I'm the one who operates at the moment. I've put it out on my social, media, I've put it out 
by email and I've sent it to a number of environmental organizations and actually some uh, press outlets. I wasn't expecting any particular level of uptake. If I can get one person to buy the book and uh, decide to make some changes in his or her life, that'd be a success. I took a lot of satisfaction from recording what I've done so far, from learning what available things there are for me to pursue in coming years, and uh, as just a confirmation of my per personal direction. And if you aren't yet convinced that this is a serious thing and that it's really hit us in the last few years, just take a look at the graph. We are sending carbon dioxide concentrations through the roof. Um, if you add into it the non-carbon dioxide gases, such as methane, methane and nitrous oxide, our carbon dioxide equivalent concentration is already over 500 parts per million. This winter, we're almost certain to hit 425 parts per million before we go into next summer's drawdown with um, vegetation in the Northern Hemisphere. The urgency of this has only gotten stronger and stronger. If we had started making changes even as late as 2000, we'd have had a steep, but obviously quite doable path to follow. That's here in the yellow. But we have delayed and we've delayed and what's happened? The concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up and up and our emissions have been rising. This has also caused ocean acidification at the same time. As a result of that, we're now in a situation where to get where we need to go, reducing emissions, we have a near vertical path ahead of us. This is extremely concerning. If we let this go, let's say, to the end of this decade, it is going to be vertical. So as it says on the bottom left here, that's the source for the graph. We're, we are now in a make or break situation, and each of us needs to rethink things that have been normal and start doing things differently. And so I'm at the end, and I'd love to take your questions. Thank you very, very much, David. Um, I'll go to questions. As I said, please put them in the in the chat. It's mainly um, so far. Oh dear, just okay. The first question is actually a comment, and it's a comment um, saying, as Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used to when we created them. And I wonder if uh, you have any more to add to that. Well, it's interesting that somebody has come up with that comment because um, on one of my email uh, uh, accounts, underneath my name, I actually have that supposed Einstein quote, the thinking that got us into this mess won't get us out of it is the way I've put it. Um, and I think that's, that's exactly the correct thing. You know, it's really economic growth and population growth and so-called advanced technology that has gotten us into this problem um, things have drastically changed since we had 2 billion people on the planet at around the beginning of the... We have 8 billion people now. That's a, that's a phone that I have in the background that I need to turn on. Yeah, Mike, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the, the uh, Einstein quote was a... Um... Here, let me come visible. The Einstein quote was a lead up to the idea that there's a fundamental difference between cutting back on material consumption and expanding the fulfillment that one gets from living. 
there comes a point in the latter where one doesn't have time or much interest in material consumption. Both of these phrases describe the same thing, but one speaks from one way, the old way of thinking, and the other speaks from the new way of thinking. Well, I would agree with that. Um, I should tell you that in one of my other books, which I'm currently having slightly to revise, um, these are cli-fi books. Uh, that is a, a subgenre of science fiction, climate fiction. Uh, one of the thing, one of the, it's called the rich one, and uh, the central character becomes immense. What he finds is that while he continues to get more and more wealth, he isn't getting any happier. And yeah. actually, I mean, I used to do um, health economics research and that's, that's common in the, uh, I guess you could call it sociology literature. We have done lots of studies of how happy people are at different levels of wealth and um, once you reach essentially a stable platform, if you want to call it that, um, getting more money doesn't make you happier. In fact, for many people, it makes you less happy. Why? Well, if you have a few million bucks, your child is suddenly a, a potential target for kidnappers. So is your wife or your husband. Your business could be taken hostage. The mafia might become interested in coming in and, you know, shoe, shoehorning into your business. It's not necessarily, uh, how should I put it? It's not necessarily the be all and end all that it's made out to be by many people. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble uh, getting these messages to display properly. Uh, it was working fine and now it's not. <laughs> Anyhow, there is an, an, another question in, in the chat and I uh, just, oh, this is ridiculous. Peter, I believe it's me. I'm, I'm, I was next. And, and so okay. I'll go ahead while, while you're trying to set Thank that you. up. Um, one thing that is uh, undergoing a fair amount of transformation around the world is the uh, decarbonization of the electrical power world. And of course, um, this means conversion over to, to uh, wind and, and solar energy and ultimately aggregating uh, all those together to make equivalent of a power plant. And of course, it's called a virtual power plant. Uh, David, did you in, get to that level in, in your book as uh, saying how, how people can participate within? I, um, I, 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 as you know, have, have done a fair amount of um, work in, in uh, following along on developments around the world. And, and of course, the, uh, uh, the Australians are, are, are really leading the world in, in this realm. And uh, um, they, they do get a lot of uh, active participation from the um, uh, communities that, that they're operating in. Um, so have you, have you uh, addressed that at all in your book? I have. So uh, there are at least half a dozen different recommendations in the book uh, that have to do with how you get your power. Uh, you can put solar on your house as you have done. You can put wind on your house as I think you're planning. You can participate in co-ops that are producing um, energy from renewable sources like the Ottawa Renewable Energy Co-op, which I mentioned in the book, and, and I'm an investor in that. Um, you can be an investor in um, companies that generate uh, renewable energy from things like large solar farms and large wind farms. Um, I have been, I'm not currently, but I have been in the past an investor in organizations like that. Um, you could become a member of a virtual power plant or um, a community microgrid. Um, yours is just a, uh, essentially your unit, but you could be in um, 
an organization that's, let's say, uh, a few square city blocks, and they're all hooked together with a generating capacity. There's a, there's a uh, town in southern Alberta that's like that. They've got about 90 homes that are all hooked together. So yeah, some of that's been covered. Okay, th thank you very much. Peter? David Pollock, you're up and you had a comment or do you have a question? Yeah, I think he, he was just a comment. Okay, and he, uh, Julius, former president of Tanzania once wrote, there must be a level of consumption beyond which we need not go. Otherwise, all of us are always poor. And the next one is another comment, Secretary of the Treasury uh, in Obama administration said that uh, after the enormous failure that nearly brought down the global financial collapse and was resolved by international taxpayers at the tune of trillions of dollars, but no accountability greed caused it. He dare proposed that there were near-term solutions coming about, and one of them was that China was committed to consume as much as the United States. Would you like to comment on that? Well, um, it boggles my mind to think that we could ever get to as many as 10 billion people because I don't think we can handle the 8 billion people we currently have. If we want to bring everybody up to the sort of um, average lifestyle of an American or Canadian, uh, we need two and a half Earths. Perhaps it's arguably only two, but where's the other one? We can't do that. Everybody's got a right to a certain basic standard of living, shelter and food and water. If we're going to provide that for everybody securely, then we can't have large numbers of people. And I would argue there are thousands of billionaires and tens of thousands of millionaires, maybe even more than that. Uh, we can't have them consuming as much as they're doing. And I think that applies probably to everybody who's a member of KCOR. Thank you. Uh, William Reese, uh, you're next. And after that, another one by David Pollock. Is David Pollock still there? I don't see him. Okay. No, I don't see him either. Okay. William? Yeah. Bill Reese? Yeah, I am here, Dave. Thank you very much for that. I think this is a really interesting endeavor on what we can do at the individual level. But my question is this. As you know, I think climate change is a horrific problem, but it's only a symptom of overshoot, which is the real problem. And your last remarks actually addressed that. So why did you focus on climate change and not its cause, which is the fact that there are too damn many people consuming too much energy and material on a finite planet? Okay, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, I think what I was doing in the book, first of all, is responding to the sets of questions and observations that were provided to me from the young gentleman that I mentioned. And it was clear that uh, this kind of thing is top of mind in, among himself and his friends, his circle of friends. And, uh, my own feeling is if we can't solve climate change, which is relatively easy compared to probably at least nine other existential threats, we won't get time to solve those other nine threats. I love them, leave them. <laughs> I, I've got, my, my only objection to that is that you can't really solve climate change in isolation from the other major symptoms. Uh, you've got to confront them all directly. In fact, my, most of what we're doing to, solve climate change, which has now been going on for about 20 years, I mean, the effort to solve it, we've seen no halt in the exponential uptick in, in emissions. And in fact, I just read uh, the I International Energy uh, Commission's most recent report this morning, and we're once again up in production and consumption of oil, gas, and fossil fuels generally. So the march goes on despite our efforts to control climate change because we're still trying to support the growth in consumption 
and population beyond the current 8 billion people. And that yeah, was- I, said, I, said, I agree, I agree entirely. I agree okay. entirely, but I would, I would give you a slightly different look on, we've been trying to control climate change. I don't think we have. I mean, what do you mean? I mean, look, we've invested billions in wind and solar and alternative energy, but the growth of demand is increasing faster than the uh, implementation of alternative energy. So it's a zero sum game, unless you look at the overshoot problem, which is to stop growth and reduce the number of consumers. So I, I, agree with, I agree with both of those, but when you mentioned that we've invested billions in renewable energy, I would say during the same time period, we've we have invested trillions in fossil fuels. So we are we are not attempting to cut emissions. Well, I look again. I agree, but the reason that we've invested trillions in fossil fuels is because electricity is not a real substitute. Even if we were to electrify, <laughs> pardon me, uh, use renewables for the electrical system, that's only nineteen percent of global energy consumption. Eighty-six percent, right? No, eighty-three percent is still fossil fuels. And until you address that through reducing consumption and population, it, 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 we're, we're just going to be doing what we've been doing, uh, growing both our fossil fuel emissions and our investment in alternatives, which isn't solving the problem. Anyway, I've made my point. I, I don't think I'll Okay, that. just one, one last comment, if I might. Uh, I did make the point in the book that we should be looking at fam family planning in their own families. And that does address the population issue. And I made the point in the book in many different places, drive less, fly less, okay? Consume less, don't buy so many clothes, and on and on and on. There are lots of them. Okay, this name of overshoot, get the name out there. We've got to recognize <laughs> that those things are overshoot problems, not uh, climate change directly. Anyway, I think it's a great effort. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Thank That's you. Thank you. Can I, can I Peter McKinnon. I'd just like to throw in a comment before Bill disappears. Um, what actions can be taken that deal with overshoot that aren't included in the things that deal with climate change? It seems that they're all about reducing consumption and, and the number of consumers. Well, for one thing, uh, we could go to full cost pricing. If we started to internalize the externalized costs of most of what people buy, the economy would adjust enormously to vastly reduce the consumption of goods uh, that people shouldn't actually be uh, using. You couldn't, most people would not be, and by the way, it would be discriminatory against relatively poor people, so there would have to be adjustments to the social system. But air traffic is a complete travesty under these circumstances. Private automobiles probably are. We should be uh, doing everything we can to force manufacturers to increase the longevity of every product made so that it lasts at least 20 to 30 years. All of those things were grotesquely reduced, not grotesquely, but greatly reduced the throughput of energy and material in this economy. And then in addition, we need to get off the fence on the population issue because I think Dave is absolutely right. We're already in overshoot. Going to eight or 10 billion people would be destructive of the biophysical capacity of Earth, and then we all go down. So we need to address this population issue. If the Catholic Church, the US government, most uh, governments are lamenting the fact that we see peak population in rich countries. And that's where we should be focusing in many respects because one less rich person means the same as 15 or 20 fewer people in a poor country. So this is a huge issue. And to focus on it one window at a time ignores the other 2,000 windows, which have to be addressed simultaneously or the whole building is enclosed. OK. OK. Uh, I, um, I wonder if we could go to Peter McKinnon and after that, Rick Carpenter. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter. Oh, it's not working. Peter, I can hear you. Go ahead with your question. Oh, oh good. Thank you, Dave. Um, I, I must have two systems open here. Uh, my question was about um, whether you, what your opinion is about uh, circular, circular economy and donut economics. Um, well, so following right 
right on Bill's uh, heels. You've asked the other big question in, in uh, the important elephant in the room, haven't you? Uh -huh. um, yeah. uh, of course, it was not something I was trying to address in this book. If we can bring it about, we might be able to support as many as about a billion people on the planet. going to be very difficult to try to support more than that. I don't care whether you've got a circular economy or not. So that's that's my main comment. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, next, Rick Carpenter, and after him, Ted Manning. Great presentation, Dave. And um, I think Bill Reese has answered my question. Uh, my question was really there to provoke a discussion of the population. Uh, in other words, even if we deal with the greenhouse gas emissions and eliminate them entirely with other sources of energy, <clears throat> we still are facing a very serious problem. And Bill has spoken to that. And uh, you may want to make some more comments about that. But uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, I agree entirely. Uh, I think one of the other people who has contributed to our Zoom presentation series, Julian Cribb, has already given us two talks and we'll give another one in the spring, um, has recently written a book which has now been, um, uh, at least links to it, put on our website. Um, you know, he's he's seen 10 existential threats and you could argue that it's really one existential threat. It's just too many people. Um, it, it certainly is the root cause of our problems. Uh, our attitudes also contribute to it. I mean, if, if you have a thousand people and, each, and they're all sleeping, minimal effect. If you have a thousand people and they're all driving monster trucks, <laughs> a lot of effect. Okay. Anyway, you mean I go back to this again. If if we can get people starting to change their personal behaviors, and by the way, in the book, in the last chapter of the book, one of the things that I'm advocating people do is they become politically active and ask for governments to start making societal changes through their programs and their policies. Then we can see the we can see the kind of coordinated effort that has to be made, and it needs to be a lot more than, as I call her, Greta the Great says, blah blah blah. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you, Ted. You're on, and after that, uh, Lynn Oliphant. Blah blah blah. Uh, look, the uh, the I'm at great risk of actually agreeing with Bill Reese and Dave Doherty at the same time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it comes down to trying to get social change to actually happen. And I'm just wondering whether governments or any kind of institutions have the guts to come out and just say, "Sorry, you don't get more than 1.3 children," and your quota in terms of consumption of whatever we choose to put it in uh, is this, and that's your life's, life's uh, uh, allocation. And so you better start working within it. Now, okay, well, that, would remember, that work? Remember yes, though that, would. Could they make it happen? Answer that one. Okay, remember though that we are already doing that because what we're doing at the moment is we're saying, you don't get to drive a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. I know you don't have a Ferrari in your driveway. Why not? Wouldn't not it be fair for you to have a because Ferrari? Because the Hummer takes all the space. Okay, but well, <laughs> why don't you have two Hummers? Yeah, because right. the economic system says you don't have enough money to have two Hummers. Okay, okay so, so we are you're already use the economic system to pry people's attitudes and to force them to behave in certain ways. Uh, what I'm saying is we're already doing that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What we need to have people start doing is to exercise self-control, mm -hmm. okay? You don't have to drive, let's say, to Montreal for the weekend to see a movie. Forget the movie, do something else, do it local. 
Thank you. By the way, good luck with the book. Thank you. How are you going to make it? How are you going to push it down the right throats to make it actually make a difference? That's the challenge. <laughs> well, it is a challenge, except that I didn't set out to try to make a difference, if you will. There you go. Yeah. I set out to answer this guy's questions and to help him. Mm -hmm. It also helped me. And I was very gl glad to have gone through the process of doing it. And if it can help other people at the same time, then I'll be really happy. Thanks. <laughs> okay, thanks, Lynn. And after Lynn, uh, Mike Nickerson. Uh, certainly, thanks so much for, for the talk. My question relates to uh, your young man saying it's very difficult when you're embedded in an unsustainable system with a government that uh, promotes unsustainable practices. Uh, I don't know if everybody realizes it or not, but uh, there's a major movement down in the States right now uh, to move towards a more, uh, a better electoral system. It's not completely proportional, but uh, they're using ranked ballots in both uh, the state of Maine and Alaska. If in the 2000 election, we had a ranked ballot there, Al Gore would have been made president. And I think it would have driven the world uh, onto the climate change problem uh, a quarter of a century ago. So my question to you is, do you see any hope of moving towards a more uh, uh, a, a fair uh, uh, electoral system here in Canada? And, and do you think it would do any good? Uh, well, last question first. I do think it would do a lot of good. Um, I actually wrote a paper, which is up on the KCOR website about this. Uh, it's talking about um, uh, governance reform, different thinking. And it, it advocates something close to a jury system for selecting the people who are going to serve in our legislatures. So it's not quite the same uh, as ranked ballots. I thought there was... Uh, I thought there was some hope when our current prime minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, said that he would try to bring in proportional re representation. But once he got in, he decided that wasn't a good idea. Nobody's ever asked him, in my experience, to explain why he did that. <laughs> uh, and I'm not sure that he has done that publicly. I think it was a mistake. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm not a great believer in hope neither that it is any good nor that we need it. And uh, I do like the term hopium. My preferred approach is when you're in real trouble, as I think we are now, what you have to have is grim determination. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Love that house in the background. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, you're on. Okay, well, I, I'll, oops, my, yep. I would just uh, say, let's have uh, enthusiastic determination as well. Uh, my point really is that somehow we need to comprehend and, and per perceive what the post crisis culture will be like. And instead of looking at cutting back at what we're doing in the conventional culture, to have some notion of what we have to, acqu to acquire, you know, what's available to us in the new world. And, and to come at it from that perspective to some extent, because uh, talking from the perspective of the old paradigm uh, reinforces it in a way, like it's, it's a good thing. I'm, I'm not knocking all these points, but we do have to create an image of where we're going because you can't get there unless you know where it is. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, John Leg. I wish I had a crystal ball, but I don't. John, Leg, are you still there? Uh, yes, uh, coming up, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, David, uh, congratulations on taking on this very worthwhile project. And I look forward to uh, going through your individual recommendations. Uh, that's the comment. My question has to do with, I guess, the broadest one of all, uh, in the context of the Club of Rome. And uh, as we all know, uh, the main question is, 
or let's just say the main position of the Club of Rome is that it is very unwise to continue uh, with our growing demands on the planet. So my question is, <laughs> because we're so, there's so much work to be done on this. And your, your book, which I look forward to going through, is, well, it, it will answer, I'm sure, all the individual ways that we, as individuals, can attack the question. Now, for those of us who have followed and been involved in the, the broadest question, that is, limits to growth, uh, when one looks at the leadership of the world, they are completely on the opposite tack. That is to say, for example, and this is not a, a main leader of the world, but Justin Trudeau, he believes in growth. Keep up the growth and we'll get to the point uh, faster. Well, what he doesn't realize is that he's running faster towards the cliff. And so I, I just sometimes wonder whether it's worth taking on this larger question uh, of increasing demands on the planet. Uh, so uh, what, what's, your, what's your take on that? So I remain committed uh, to doing exactly that, taking on the grand challenge. Uh, it was described back in the 80s, I suppose, as the problematique. If you look through the old publications of KCOR, um, lots of people have attempted to take on this grand challenge at a much higher level than what I was attempting to do with this book. So three that I've read recently, for example, there's a book by Mark Carney and one by Seth Klein and one by Bill Gates, all of them attempting to deal with this. Um, they're really talking about the at the level of large businesses, um, banks and consortia and governments. Not at all what I was trying to address in this book and certainly essentially of no interest to my son-in-law. Um, so, I mean, you're asking me for of opinions about things that are not covered in the book. I have no problem with giving you that, just the proviso that that's not being really addressed by the book, except in that in the last channel, in the last chapter, I have said, you should become politically active. This actually does matter to you. If you think that politics doesn't concern you, if you don't think that you're at the table or can be at the table, I got news for you. If you're not at the table, you're going to be on the table they're gonna eat you alive. So this really does affect you personally. That's apart from everything else that's going on. You know, there are large organizations out there, that are, out there that are attempting to, if you will, go green. And I really hate people who are greenwashing, but aside from the greenwashing real problem, there are people who are trying to go green. Um, so, yeah, we need to address these problems, and and you're right. You know that cliff that that's getting steeper and steeper. As that last graph that I showed you, it's getting steeper every day that we don't do something. And we can't just leave it to governments. We can't just leave it to large corporations. They've already proven that they're not yet adequately, substantially going in the right direction. I think actually Ted and I wrote the final chapter of the last uh, State of the Environment report for the government of Canada back in the mid 1990s. And I came up with this sort of vision of what's going on. We can see the road, but we're facing the wrong way. Oh, oh, oh. wow. Okay, good, good. good. I, I, I'm with you, I take your point, thank you. Nice, nice phrase. And I have a green shirt on, so 
Anyhow, Susha, <laughs> you have your hand up. I'm sorry, I, ho I have just noticed that. Okay. Uh, can you allow me the video? Yes. Am oh, I... I... Okay. All so, right. um, are you able to hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, this is excellent discussion, actually. A lot of points are already made, but I just wanted to uh, identify a couple of things um, which I experienced. Uh, number one, uh, as you already said, our government or whether it is our broadcaster like uh, CBC and others, they, they are still focusing that oh, population is getting older, the, what to do about it and increase the younger population or import the population from other countries. And, and the government is sucking up to it. And there is absolutely no public forum uh, in, the, in, the, in the general public, uh, which will raise this issue that we have to manage with, with the existing infrastructure without uh, you know, creating more problem. And the other thing I noticed that I, I had to travel between Canada and India in the last couple of years for family reasons. And it takes a couple of hours more and Air Canada has been speeding up to inefficient uh, flying um, uh, to overcome uh, avoiding the Russian air, air, airspace. That's because all the NATO countries have banned Russia and Russia banned all of us. And uh, so there was no, no, uh, uh, no respect is paid to the, uh, uh, to the environment or minimize the fuel. The other thing I noticed that in Canada, most of our homes have AC and we need to come up with a plan how to, how to convince the manufacturer to modify the AC, ACs to become a heat pump rather than installing new one. And uh, anyway, I, I don't expect solutions for this, but at least I'm just highlighting a couple of things I noticed. So as far as uh, things like longer trips, I did address that in the book and said that in my view, we need to be staying closer to home and going on trips less frequently. With respect to heat pumps, I have put one in my own home and uh, I think it's a great idea and it needs to be part of uh, higher level government planning. I'm not sure that it is adequately there as yet. And as far as uh, a public forum with respect to um, uh, population growth and aging, um, well, first of all, aging isn't the problem that many people um, put it out to be. I studied this for eight, eight years when I was at Health Canada. Um, and we certainly don't need to solve it by population growth because what that's going to do is going to mean that a number of years down the road, you're going to have a more aging people. So no, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, there are fora that are available for public comment and <clears throat> participants can turn those fora to any subjects they like. And we can even be like politicians. We get asked a question and choose to answer some other question or make some other point. Like, well, what kind of shoes are you wearing? Well, the book I'm reading at the moment wait a minute, you didn't answer my question at all. Well, of course not. I wanted to make the point that I'm reading a particular book. I don't care about your shoes. We do this to us all the time. Yeah, okay, the heat pump issue, uh, what I what I'm, was leading up to, we have about 10 million uh, air conditioner installed across Canada on our homes. We need to actually upgrade those ACs, not bring a new, uh, new heat pump, but actually modify those. We have to force the vendor because we have in, uh, you know, all the pumps and piping is there. They have to just configure the condensers for both ways. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what, I mean, they took out my, they took out my furnace. They took away my air conditioners. I'm sure they recycled them, uh, but they put a heat pump in, in place of those two units. 
And we need to be doing that at a rate probably in the neighborhood of 10 or 20,000 per year for the first year or two, but it needs to grow to about 500,000 units a year. And this is actually probably achievable. I haven't done calculation on this. This is coming off the top of my head. Um, but a lot of these units, you know, they only have about a 15 to 25 year lifespan. Uh, a lot of these were put in that long ago. They're about to be replaced. We could make it so that you have to pay a premium to put in air conditioning. But if you want to put in heat pump, yeah, no extra charge. Okay, thank you. Is that Thanks. all? Of and uh, I'd like to ask if um, Paul, Paul, are you ready? Did you have a question? Uh, I, I just wanted to make a comment, if I might. Yes. Um, David, a great, uh, a great job you're doing there. And this has been an interesting discussion. What I wanted to say was when I first joined KCOR, I spoke at the officer's mess about my experience at the Stockholm conference, where the big message from Stockholm 1972 was zero population growth. I came home, announced to my wife that the other two children we were planning, we were not we were not going to have, which we did not. And since then, I've been an observer, if you like, of the whole issue related to the survival of the planet. Our generation has been the most privileged generation in the history of mankind and will probably go down in history in that role. Unfortunately, future generations are going to have a real problem. So population is a big concern. And I've said for many years that one of the things our government should do to limit population is to cut the baby bonus off after two kids. So that would not be very popular politically, but uh, maybe it's something that should be thought about. So I really am concerned about the government ramping up just to drive growth, the number of immigrants coming into this country, when what the planet needs to do is work towards lowering the population and getting there in hopefully a humane way. I'll just leave my those thoughts. Oh, so everybody. excellent, excellent comments, and especially the last thing that you said. My real concern is that as we approach this cliff, if we plan, if we use our intelligence and our knowledge, our accumulated wisdom, we may well be able to do this in a humane way. And that's certainly what I hope. But back to Susha's point, Russia doesn't seem to be intent on that. Russia <laughs> seems to be intent on wiping Ukraine off the face of the earth. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Peter McKinnon, you have a couple more points. Did you have anything you wanted to add at this point? No. And Bill Reese? I don't, no, I don't have anything to add. Uh, you could maybe just read my comment if you wish. I've actually got two. <laughs> could you pick out the one you want to read? Uh, yeah. The one, the first one, I think, was uh, maybe more relevant. Uh, I'm just going. I made a comment uh, that Ted's uh, co talk about um, uh, population. I thought it struck me as it was even a tougher stand he was prescribing than China's one-child policy. And uh, for those of you who are fam not familiar, China about uh, several years ago made a two-child policy, and it is now a three-child policy. So they're actually facing a very serious demographic problem, like South Korea or Korea in general, and the uh, Korean Peninsula, as well as Japan. Right. Yeah, I might be able to respond a little more to that. Uh, they have realized that, of course, a crude policy of just ordering people to have a certain number of children, whether it's too many or too few, did, does not pay off. And they are facing the difficulty of the demographics where, in fact, just like Japan and many others, uh, there aren't enough people to support and even take care of the aging population. That's just the opposite of what it is in, say, Africa, where uh, immense growth is going. Both are huge challenges. 
Uh, there is a reasonable deb international debate on how migration from one place that is quote overpopulated to one that is underpopulated can be a solution. It is as demographically and politically fraught with problems as ordering people not to have children or ordering them to have more. But it is also seen by a lot of the think tanks now as being one of the prime issues that the world is going to have to cope with in both ways at, at both uh, many of those levels that said uh, many of the conflict zones in the world do involve where the growing populations and the shrinking populations have a frontier okay thank you walter do you have a question Uh, no, no, I didn't have a question. I was just putting comments on the uh, in the chat, but I agree with uh, most things uh, said here. Uh, in particular, that uh, you know, it can't. It's not just a population issue. It's a it's a consumption issue as well. It, they, you know, it's a product of the two. Period. Uh, you can't really go around that. Uh, and and the other comment I had was uh, you know this comment about no public forum for dealing with the population issue. Um, why don't we start one, like, you know, literally having a, an event around it for Ottawa? Hmm. Just a thought. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry, I haven't been able to give people advance notice, but uh, Claude, I, you have a question. Yes, I, I don't have a career to uh, protect. So uh, I'm going to be very rude and go a little radical here, David, and I'm going to invite you to speculate. But, um, and by the way, in the, in the chat, I put in Dave Reese's or uh, William Reese's uh, seven days ago, we had a two hour interview with someone who it turns out happens to be in Minnesota, someone I never heard of, but uh, he talks about overshoot. And um, I haven't watched the whole thing because it is two hours, <laughs> but um, he started to talk about, you know, these systems change, it takes so long and our time is so short. So I'm going to start out my comment question, but I'm actually interested in Dave's opinion because he'd studied this a lot. Uh, let's assume that there is no orderly planned um, turndown of hydrocarbons. And what can be done? When will it be? And we, we've talked a little bit about this in the informal hangouts on Friday afternoons where we're a little bit freer to speak, but I'll be rude and, and talk this way. Uh, what, what is the body count that's required? What is the revolution that is required before people say, you know, what we should do is nationalize, perhaps even internationalize the hydrocarbons. And of course, that's a preposterous uh, suggestion except that, wait a second, Russia is nationalizing the wheat fields of Ukraine. That's not preposterous. And Ukraine is blowing up uh, refineries within Russia. That, that's normal. That's the world we live in. So when will, and perhaps it'll be clandestine uh, people working for the government, that we start bombing each other's hydrocarbon um, extraction points. And uh, you know, I come from the sales world, so the 80-20 rule works real fine for me. Even if we don't get 100% of it, what, what would the price of oil and its use do if suddenly over a period of three years, we went down to 20% of the extraction that's taking place now, which by the way, is at record high. We have never done more damage to the future climate of the planet than we are right now as we speak. We have not hit peak, peak uh, hydrocarbon. So with that really too wordy, uh, challenge to you, Dave. What are your opinions on all this? Okay, well, the first thing um, that I'll say is I think you need to read a book by Gwyn Dyer, which is Climate Wars, if you haven't already. Excellent book. Um, in many ways, goes into the kind of speculation for which you just called. Uh, I have I think to other members in KCOR, certainly to my own family said that I, I believed at one time that if a million Americans died in a heat wave, it would change the way that the American populace thinks about climate change. I no longer think that's true 
because over a million people have been killed in the COVID pandemic in the United States, and it hasn't really changed attitudes towards com um, communicable disease. So I would say now you're probably looking at, you'd have to lose two to three million people, 1% of the population in one summer. And uh, worldwide, hmm, think about this, 1% of the world population of 8 billion people is 80 million. So could you see that kind of, of death toll in, in say an extended drought and major problem over say all of Asia? You sure could. They've got nearly 3 billion people and could tens of millions of them die? Well, it's happened before. Uh, China lost untold millions of people in the Great Leap Forward. So will millions of people cause us to change the way that we're approaching this? Uh, millions of deaths, that is, change the way that we're approaching this? Yeah, it might have that effect. It may not. And, you know, we we may be going towards, I don't know, extinction for humanity because we fail to change our approach. That's a very <laughs> sad commentary on us. I, I want to share one of the things that I have come to a conclusion because I also do a lot of work on uh, nuclear weapons and uh, Given the current situation, uh, I find that we are now, at, and every, a lot of people agree, we are now in the worst situation and most likely situation that we're going to have a nuclear war. And uh, that will lead to uh, an awful lot of extinction. Plus, uh, a lot of stuff in the atmosphere that will probably reduce a little bit the climate warming. But that's a very, very negative way uh, of looking at things. But the way things are going, it's, it's uh, you don't know which one is going to get us first. I'd I'm like sorry. To make a comment. I'd like to make a comment. Um, no. It's it's my belief, and I don't think there's any way to prove this. Maybe some brilliant person could do so. Uh, it's my belief that World War II put so much dust into the atmosphere that it masked for about 15 years the warming that was caused by all of the fuel that was burned during that period. An interesting th thought. It'd be interesting. And, and by the way, I was just reading this morning that um, large dust storms, primarily out of the Sahara, are doing exactly that right now. Yeah. There's a lot of that. I uh, Most of the things in the chat are comments. Uh, is there anyone else who wishes to make a comment or a question? Well, if not, whoops, sorry. What I think we should do is, is to wind this up and we can yep. move into the informal part. Okay, very good. Well, thank you very, very much, David. And I'm going to call, I don't know if this uh, is allowed or not, but I think we'll ask Jean, his wife, to thank him. <laughs> That'll be new. I get to thank I get to thank him. A bit awkward, but yes, on behalf of the uh, uh, K of KCOR, Dave, it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to thank you for giving this presentation and the opportunity for people to, to think about this. I do know um, when Dave was writing this book, it was focused on what an individual who doesn't have the background of people from KCOR could actually do. So that was it was geared to a, a different kind of, of population. So Dave, thank you for thinking in those terms and appreciate that very much. 
uh, for, I think most of the people here now are people from KCOR, but um, I really would like to say, please go to our website, canadiancore.com, to find information about this talk and other talks that have been uh, presented to KCOR. The easiest way to do that is sign up for Stay Informed, and you will get the links to this talk and other talks. In addition to that, on our website, we have information about become a becoming a member of KCOR. Um, I would like to encourage you to do this if you haven't done so already. And for those of you who are KCOR members, please remember that it is now January and you can sign up for 2023. That would be great. In addition to that, if you don't particularly want to be a member of KCOR, but uh, would like to contribute something to help us continue the work that we've been doing, you are able to donate to KCOR as well using the same uh, link on the website. So with that, again, Dave, thank you very much. And I look forward to some of the informal discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.